It's a tale straight from a horror movie. A group of adventurous students go hiking in the frozen mountains and all wind up dead, their corpses strewn around their campsite and the cause never discovered. Unfortunately, this is no movie, but the horror is very real. This is the story of the Dad Love Pass incident. 1959, a group of 10 students from the Ural Polytechnical Institute in the Soviet Union planned a skiing expedition across the Ural Mountains. The group, led by 23-year-old Igor Dyatlov, were all certified Grade 2 hikers and would receive Grade 3 certification on completion of the trip, which was, at the time, the highest certification one could receive in the country. Their three-week journey was planned for late January and early February, and although the freezing conditions would be particularly treacherous during this time, their route was approved by a regional athletic commission, as the group were all experienced hikers. And so, the group, consisting of eight males and two females, took an overnight train out of the city of Sverdlovska and began their expedition. In the freezing cold, one member with pre-existing health conditions, Yuri Yudin, has to turn back on the 28th of January, suffering from pain in his joints. Although he is sad he must abort the hike, his decision will save his life. The nine remaining will not survive the trip. From here, recovered diaries and photographs suggest that the group had progressed as planned until the 1st of February, where it seems that bad weather conditions had led them astray. When they realized they were not where they were supposed to be, they decided to camp in place and rejoin the planned route the next day. This meant their tent was more exposed to the elements than it would have been had they stayed on track and set up in a more sheltered location as planned. Now, they were camped on the eastern slope of the forebodingly named Holat Siakl, or Death Mountain. Before setting out, the group's leader, Igor Dyatlov, had promised to contact the sports club in Sverdlovska when the group had made it safely back to their base around the 12th of February. When this date came and went without any message from Dyatlov, no suspicions were raised. It wasn't unlikely that the group had just been delayed, especially in the bad weather. But a week passed and there was still no contact. A worrying red flag. Student volunteers from the university set out on a search and rescue party. They would later be joined by the authorities and indigenous Mansi tribesmen. On the 26th of February, the searchers find the group's tent half collapsed in the snow. Inside, the group's rucksacks, supplies, clothes and boots were still present, but there was no one still in the tent. Strangely, the tent had been slashed open, seemingly from the inside. Outside, there are frozen footprints in the snow leading away from the tent. Sickeningly, the footprints suggest that the majority of their makers were only wearing socks and some were barefoot. With temperatures well below freezing, the searchers know this does not bode well for the fate of the group. The following day, the first two bodies are found in a forest roughly a kilometer away from the tent. The men are dressed only in their underwear. Beside them, the remains of a small campfire. The tree that they lie under shows signs that the lower branches had been stripped off to create the fire. Between here and the campsite, three more bodies are found, hundreds of meters away from one another. They are in varying states of dress. It seems like they were on their way back to the tent when they died. Among them are Igor Dyatlov himself and one of the girls. The other man has a fractured skull. The remaining four are undiscovered for nearly three months until the snow melts and they are found in a ravine in the forest. These are the furthest away from the camp and the best dressed. One has a fractured skull. Two have multiple broken ribs and are missing their eyes. Of these two, one is missing her tongue. Some of the bodies are found wearing clothes that do not belong to them. Apparently, as members of the group began to fall, the survivors took their clothes for their own. Some of the clothes are found to have elevated levels of radiation. And so, the investigation begins, ringing in the start of a decades-long mystery. How did Dyatlov's group perish? At first, it was suspected that the nearby indigenous Mansi had something to do with it, attacking the students as they encroached on their lands. The Soviet authorities took some of them in for weeks of interrogation. 
However, the Mansi denied it, and it seemed they were truthful. There were no other footprints to suggest external interference, and there was no other evidence that any other humans were near the group when they died. It was unlikely that the injuries they had suffered could have been caused by man due to the severe nature of the trauma. With the possibility of foul play struck out, the investigation was closed in May. It was ruled that the group had met with an insurmountable force of nature, for example a hurricane or an avalanche, and most had succumbed to hypothermia. Any injuries sustained were as a result of this natural force. The case was closed and the files were sent to a secret archive, as was usual for the Soviet Union. However, many felt this resolution was inconclusive, as it still left many unanswered questions about what exactly happened to the group. This has led to many, many theories over the years. Let's first take a look at forces of nature, like an avalanche. One theory is that the group is awoken during the night to the sounds of an imminent snowslide, and so leaves in a hurry. Some don't even have time to put on clothes. Somewhere along their rush to safety, a number of the students are caught up and killed in the avalanche and deposited in the ravine, explaining their injuries. Any of the more grisly injuries are caused after the fact by scavengers or natural degradation of bodies exposed to the elements. The survivors make it to the shelter of the forest but are now obviously freezing and so they build a fire. It's decided that the two worst dressed should stay by the fire while the others head back to fetch supplies. These three fall to the cold and are left behind one by one until they are all dead. The two waiting back at the fire suffer the same fate. It seems very plausible except for a number of contradicting factors. An avalanche leaves behind certain flow patterns and debris not present at the site. The tent was still in place and only covered in a shallow layer of snow. The mountains are not at all steep in this area and an analysis of the topology and the weather conditions that night revealed it was unlikely the group had been hit by an avalanche. So maybe the theory still stands that the group left in a panic for some unknown reason followed the same series of events as previously mentioned, only the four in the ravine were not killed by an avalanche but later on, trying to search for a more suitable location for the campsite deeper in the forest when they fell into a snow hole and died of their injuries. Still a very logical explanation, but it leaves the reason for the panic a mystery. One hypothesis posits that the winds blowing over the slopes of the mountain created a whirlwind effect known as a Carmen Vortex Street. This produces an infrasound, inaudible to humans but causing feelings of psychological discomfort or fear. This could be the reason that the students became panicked. Other theories seem less plausible, citing a yeti attack, UFOs or some paranormal activity. But perhaps the theories that include the military are closer to the truth. Many feel the students were either killed by secret experimental weapons testing or by the military after they had seen something they should not have. It was only 30 years later, during the collapse of the Soviet Union, that the original lead investigator Lev Ivanov spoke out. He said forensics experts told him that the students' severe injuries looked like they had been caught in an explosive blast. He also claimed that there had been numerous reportings of strange lights in the sky that night, but higher ups told him to ignore this line of inquest. And so the investigation was closed and Ivanov was transferred to a small town in Kazakhstan where he kept quiet about the incident for decades. So were the students' deaths the result of unknowingly walking into a testing area for experimental weapons? Is that why radiation was found on some of the clothes? Well, actually two of the students were nuclear physicists and it's speculated that their clothes had already been slightly irradiated due to their work. So that is potentially a red herring. Officials reopened an investigation into the cause in February 2019, perhaps adding credence to the idea that the authorities really didn't have anything to do with the Dyatlov Pass incident. However, they declared they would only be investigating weather-related natural causes, leaving many unsatisfied. A mountain pass leading to the area of the incident is now dedicated to the group's memory and is named in honor of their leader, Dyatlov's Pass. We still can't know for definite what happened on that mountain 
and we probably never will. Regardless of what new findings come out, it will most likely always be disputed. To know for sure, you would have had to have been there. And would anybody want that? Whatever it was that was witnessed on that night, nobody lived to tell the tale. As curious as we all are to discover the cause, maybe we should just hope that we never find out for ourselves.